everyone, it's Dr. Carroll here, where you got a Physics 40 special historical look at alternating current. And so I can't do better than the mechanical universe. So we're going to watch it. Maybe I'll make a few comments as we watch alternating current, the mechanical universe. And then we have one more shorter video called Alternating Current Explained. And I'll pause it and say a few things as we go through. So here we go, and um, I might as well make it full screen, right? And away we go. Did he just not shake his hand? this intro, eh? The intro is the full 35 minutes of the I have a time like that, I think. A while ago, I showed you one way to generate electric power using a lemon. When you do that, you get what's called direct current. Last time, I showed you another possibility. That involved using a simple coil of wire and a magnet. When you generate power this way, the, the current runs back and forth or up and down, and it's called alternating current. And this is the way nearly all power, electrical power, is generated. The best way of doing it is not to move the coil back and forth, but to make it spin around steadily like that in the magnetic field. And that is the way virtually all electric power is really generated. But of course, generating the power that way requires energy to spin the coil against the magnetic forces and drive the current around. That's usually done using a heat engine, a gas turbine, which is fired by a fossil fuel like oil or coal or gas or by a nuclear reactor, or even by water in a hydroelectric generator. Which is the most common in Manitoba. I wanted to show you how to build one of these, in case you're ever stranded on a desert island and have to reconstruct civilization from scratch. <laughs> so I had a simple one made up for you. This is a water wheel, which goes around like that when there's water running on it. And when it goes around, it turns a coil, much like that one over there, between the poles of this permanent magnet. The electrical output of the generator comes out on that oscilloscope, which is simply a device for showing the voltage. As long as the trace on the oscilloscope is going across horizontally, nothing is happening. But when we start generating electric power, it will start going up and down like this. Okay, so when you see that going up and down, you know that we're generating electricity. And all I have to do to generate electricity is to turn on the water. All right, are you ready for this? You better get out your umbrellas in the first few rows. Here we go. And there it is, hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric power. No mortal created it, but a hundred years ago, one man could foresee its enormous potential. As a child, he'd read of Niagara Falls and dreamt of a wheel run by these cascading waters. Eventually, his dream took the shape of a vast electric power grid and spun like a dynamo to drive the modern industrial age. The man's name was Nikola Tesla, and his vision, a theory and practice that could finally harness the power of Niagara, was grounded in the principle of alternating current. Alternating current, AC, is an oscillating current. It is produced by a voltage that rises and falls, positive and negative like a sine wave. But as Nikola Tesla discovered, 
defining alternating current, was just the beginning of his ups and downs. He wanted AC to power everything on Earth. But in the real world, the world of business, that idea met with enormous resistance. Right from the start, he came up against the electrical powers that were, Thomas Alva Edison, that is, and the advocates of direct current. Direct current, DC, is a steady flow of electricity. Ideally, its voltage is constant and equal to the current, which is also constant, multiplied by the effective resistance of the circuit. Obviously, on the basic issue of alternating versus direct current, Edison and Tesla were on different wavelengths. And in what was called the War of the Currents, battle lines were drawn. But the battle reached far beyond the comparatively safe domain of scientific theory. Many other interests were involved. Fortunes were made and lost. Powerful men and ideas advanced and retreated. Just what was behind all this sound and fury? Tesla arrived in New York in 1884, a 29-year-old immigrant from Eastern Europe. Tesla had a book of poetry, fluency in a dozen languages, and less than a nickel in his pocket. But he also had a letter of introduction to Thomas Edison, who gave the young man a job redesigning dynamos at the Edison machine works. Of course, there was one condition. The dynamos had to be direct current. Dynamo is another name for a generator. And of course, since Tesla was determined to make alternating current the world standard, his career with Thomas Edison had only one way to go. Within a year, Tesla had quit, partly because Edison allegedly wouldn't keep his promise of a bonus. Tesla soon fell on hard times and was once again virtually penniless. By sticking to his principle of alternating current, Tesla had not only hit bottom, he'd thrown a wrench into the most powerful machinery on the face of the earth. When it came to putting electricity to work, no man in the world could hold a candle to Thomas Alva Edison. He was seen as the mastermind of the electric age. As the electric general of what became the General Electric Company, Edison wasn't called Napoleon simply because the actress Sarah Bernhardt said he looked the part. Even today, his headquarters, the Edison Laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, remains alive in the public imagination. As a fitting tribute, it's been reassembled from the ground up, plank by plank, and preserved at the Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. When Edison was alive, he was the creative force behind just about every bright idea under the sun. Though Edison's own hearing was impaired, his genius produced the world's first phonograph. And for the record, he also invented the motion picture camera. It was in Menlo Park, not Hollywood, that the movies really began to flicker. With this invention, Edison's ticker tape machine the blood pressure of business could rise and fall with the pulse of the stock exchange. And whatever the news, it traveled far and fast with Edison's vastly improved version of the repeating telegraph. In fact, he often refined others' inventions, making them more practical and commercially viable in the process. Others invented the first telephone and the first typewriter, but Edison developed both into handy, effective instruments. On the other hand, sometimes Edison sought to destroy, not improve, someone else's idea. The glow in Thomas Edison's heart, unlike the one he'd put here in Menlo Park, was faint indeed toward Nikola Tesla and his idea of alternating current. And no wonder. Beginning with the Sally Jordan boarding house, the first home in the world to be lit electrically, Edison's direct current was on its way to lighting every house within the limited reach of his network of power stations. And Edison knew that even in the simplest circuits, Tesla's alternating current could be full of surprises. For example, 
Consider a simple circuit that consists of an alternating voltage source, a capacitor, and an inductor. According to the mathematical rules of Gustav Kirchhoff, the rise in voltage at the source, never bigger than E sub zero, is equal to the sum of the voltage drops around the circuit. Okay, we know that from DC. We won't get into the fancy. The result of is a differential equation that can be written in terms of the charge Q on the capacitor. The same differential equation also describes the displacement x of a harmonic oscillator driven by an oscillating force. Even a small force, never bigger than F sub zero, at just the right frequency, causes oscillations that grow bigger and bigger. And that adds up to the phenomenon of resonance. Which means that, in an AC circuit, even a tiny oscillating voltage can cause the flow of an amazing amount of electric charge. Of course, in a mechanical system, the results of resonance can be shattering. But sometimes, it takes electric resonance to get the tune just right. Tesla was, in fact, the first to describe a network of tuned resonance circuits and raised antennas, which is exactly how radio and television signals are transmitted and received. No, not anymore, a single but... television station is picked out of all others because an AC circuit is tuned precisely in resonance with the broadcasting frequency. That's true of radio as well as television. An electrical resonance occurs because mathematically, capacitors and inductors act a lot like springs and masses. For example, when a capacitor starts to charge, it creates a voltage that opposes the charge. In other words, a capacitor opposes change in positive or negative charge just as a spring opposes expansion or compression. Good analogy, yeah, I like that one. On the other hand, when a voltage is applied to an inductor, it takes a while to get the current moving, or takes a while to stop it again. So an inductor opposes change in current in the same way the inertial mass on a spring opposes change in velocity. But no matter how precise the analogy, differences can arise. For example, when resonance occurs in electrical oscillators, it seldom lets people down. But when resonance occurs in mechanical oscillators, things can get out of hand. In electric circuits, resistance can help keep things from getting out of hand. For example, consider a capacitor and a resistor in an AC circuit. If the frequency is low enough, the charging and discharging of the capacitor can keep up with the oscillating applied voltage. But at higher frequency, the capacitor can't charge and discharge fast enough, so no voltage difference develops across it, and nearly all the voltage is across the resistor. On the other hand, if an inductor's in the circuit, at low frequency, there's plenty of time to build up current in it without much voltage across it. But at higher frequency, the current in the inductor can't change fast enough before it has to turn around. So the voltage is mostly across the inductor, and there's not much left across the resistor. When all the elements are in the same circuit at low frequency, most of the voltage goes into charging and discharging the capacitor.
at higher frequency, more of the voltage is used up trying to change the current in the inductor. In fact, at very high frequency, the inductor virtually keeps any current from flowing at all. But if the frequency is just right, in other words, at the resonant frequency, a quite large current flows. The capacitor charges and discharges. Current builds up and reverses in the inductor. And the resistor burns up enough energy to keep the oscillations under control. Of course, Edison and company still had the business of electricity under control. And to retain that control, they put up plenty of resistance against the increasing powers of alternating current. So, if Tesla was to win the war of the currents, he'd need a champion to rise up and do business against the forces of Thomas Edison. And that's where George Westinghouse came into the picture. Westinghouse, the legendary industrialist of Pittsburgh, was an inventor turned big businessman. But in contrast to Edison, he not only spoke glowingly of alternating current, he put his money where his mouth was and bought Tesla's patents for a polyphase induction motor. And in 1888, the war of the currents escalated. As Westinghouse went to work in support of Tesla, Edison's well-oiled machinery shifted into high gear. There were smear campaigns and, according to some people, dirty tricks. Occasionally, however, there was a meeting of the minds. Charles Steinmetz, the mathematical wizard of physics and engineering, offered a certain intellectual support to both camps. Edison and Tesla were even able to work together, but not for long and never as long as Tesla had the advantage of alternating current. In theory and practice alike, why was Tesla's method better? Obviously, the reason a plant generates electricity is to send power somewhere, to transmit it through power cables into the home, the office, or anywhere else there's a need and a handy socket. But the power is equal to the current times the voltage. We know that current. Uh, we know that equation, right? Therefore, the same power can be transmitted at high current and low voltage. Or low current and high voltage. Which is better? Remember, the power cables have a certain amount of resistance. And the longer the distance, the bigger the resistance. Because a cable's resistance is proportional to its length. We know that from the laws of resistance. And of course, passing current through a resistance causes heating, which is equal to current squared times resistance. This is wasted heat. Mm -hmm. For the power company and the consumer, that means a certain amount of energy won't be available at the other end. Since I is P over V, that heating is P squared R over V squared. So for any given power and resistance, the higher the voltage, the less power lost in transit. Yeah. In other words, the key to transmitting power efficiently is to transmit it at the highest possible voltage. In a modern electric power grid, energy is routinely transmitted over thousands of kilometers at hundreds of thousands of volts. But no matter how it's used, the recipient wants all those watts to arrive at a safe and handy voltage. And that's possible only if the electric energy can be transformed up to high voltage, which it takes to make the long trip to the consumer, and back down to low voltage for use at the end of the line. That task, raising and lowering voltage, is hard to accomplish with direct current, but with AC, it's comparatively easy. If alternating current passes through a loop or coil, it produces a constantly changing magnetic flux. This 
but take us to transformer discussion. A bar of iron, magnetized by the coil, can concentrate and intensify the changing flux. In fact, an iron ring can contain the flux entirely. And if a secondary circuit is wound around the ring, as the changing flux passes through it, a voltage is induced in it. That voltage is proportional to the number of turns around the iron. Obviously then, the voltage of the power transmitted to the secondary circuit can be made higher or lower than the voltage in the primary circuit. So although the power out is nearly equal to the power in, it can be stepped up to high voltage for long range transmission and then brought down to low voltage for safe use at the end of the line. It's exactly this principle which is the greatest advantage of Tesla's AC over Edison's DC. And while it was revolutionary at the end of the 19th century, that principle would be applied from one end of the earth to the other in the 20th. That fact, the overwhelming evidence that alternating current powers the modern industrial world, makes the case for declaring Tesla the winner in the war of the currents. On the other hand, with wars and stories alike, there are always two sides. Considering Edison's enormous contribution to the world of science and engineering, did one side really win and the other really lose? After all, Edison did have a convincing number of patents. Before Tesla, Edison built his own generators one after another, each more powerful than the last. But then, so had Tesla. And surely as well as Edison, he too built turbines and motors. However, and this was the big difference in the long run, Edison's generators could only illuminate things within the reach of his power plant, while Tesla's AC system could reach beyond the old neighborhood. With an ever-expanding grid of power lines, AC could go from coast to coast and just about everywhere in between. Nonetheless, Thomas Edison's place in history was secure. And in Menlo Park, New Jersey, his mind was still as lively as his motion picture camera. As an American inventor and electrician, no one since Ben Franklin had gone as far as Thomas Edison. But in his own way, Nikola Tesla would go even farther. Long before they became a reality, Tesla had envisioned vacuum tubes coated with phosphor and glass tubes filled with gas, fluorescent lights and neon lights. And years before the Wright brothers appeared, Tesla claimed that if aviation were to get off the ground, it would need to use a then almost unknown metal called aluminum. And while Guglielmo Marconi got the acclaim of the popular press for inventing the radio, Nikola Tesla got the credit, as well as the final verdict in the courts. Speaking of credit, some state that Tesla was denied his due for many original inventions. In all, no one can deny that Tesla was one of the most dynamic scientists who ever lived nor that his mind was fertile and inventive beyond compare. But Tesla, more interested in invention than in scientific publications, kept much of his methodology in his head. Perhaps that's why the scientific community remained dubious or miserly with its praise for years. He did, however, receive honorary doctorates from Columbia and Yale. And in the end, with unintended irony, Nikola Tesla was even honored with the Edison Medal, that most prestigious award named for none other than Thomas Edison himself.
Interesting stuff. Throughout this long yarn we've been spinning, there have always been certain individuals whom we could identify as the saints of science. These were people who were driven to scientific discovery the way moths are attracted to light. They would include Kepler and Newton, Faraday, and certainly Albert Einstein. Some of these people did very well for themselves. In fact, a few became quite wealthy. But obviously, it was not money that drove them to do what they did. But at the same time, there's always been a different kind of genius. These were people just as clever as the others, but people who had their eyes firmly fixed on the bottom line. One, of course, was Thomas Edison. But there was also James Watt and Henry Ford, and there were many others. Such people typically spend as much time in law courts litigating patents the orange, as they spend making their the inventions. Orange shirt he's sleeping, isn't One is tempted to draw a distinction between the saintly scientists and the money-grubbing technologists. But of course, there was an exception that proved the rule. Incidentally, I've never liked that phrase very much, the exception that proves the rule. I think it must come from an archaic meaning of the word to prove, which used to mean to test. An exception tests a rule. If it's truly an exception, then the rule can't be right. Well, there was an exception who tested the rule and found it wanting, and that was Nikola Tesla. Tesla was certainly a genius of the first magnitude. If Michael Faraday could imagine space filled with lines of constant force, Nikola Tesla could picture multiphase generators and multiphase motors all connected with complex electrical circuits, and when they were built, all of it would work perfectly, exactly as he had imagined it. Time and again, Tesla made fortunes and squandered them, or turned down soft jobs with fat salaries just so he could be left alone to think and to invent. You might say that Tesla, like da Vinci before him, was a true saint of engineering. He died almost forgotten and almost penniless in New York City. But it was Nikola Tesla at least as much as Thomas Edison who shaped the nature of the world that we live in today. OK, I'll see you next time. That's a good presenter, isn't it? OK, so we have. Uh, the important points in there, especially the transformer near the end. You didn't use the word transformer, but at a generating station, you start with a step-up transformer, so you have high voltage and don't have much heat loss. And then when you come towards the um, your house, your apartment, you have your substations, which are step-down transformers, so you can deal safely with uh, electricity. OK, I have one more. Um, short video that we can discuss here and uh, it's called alternating current explained so let's take a look at that one here um let me start at the beginning this one a bit controversial some people don't agree with everything here but let's just get the general idea let's go full screen welcome to this video course on power in a data center as it relates to data center racks as we'll illustrate in another video the power that enters a data center is usually three-phase alternating current power, alternating which current is more graph. commonly referred to as three-phase AC power. It's important to understand how alternating current works to be able to appreciate the fact that three-phase power is actually three lines that are 120 degrees apart. This concept confuses a lot of people, so to have that last sentence make sense, let's start with how current moves in single-phase power. Here in the top picture we have a magnet. The north pole is the positively charged pole, and the south pole is the negatively charged pole. And next to that magnet we have a copper cable. Copper is used because it has an electron that's easily moved. I'm not going to get into basic chemistry 101 that talks about nucleus and electrons and how they function. Oh, why not? I like that. Let me just state at a simple level that it takes very little force to move an electron away from a nucleus and a copper atom. That's why copper makes an excellent conductor for electrical power. With magnetic forces, positives and negatives attract. 
If you have two magnets and hold the positive ends close together and let the magnets go, they would push away from each other. If you held a positive and a negative close together, they would attract each other. Electrons are negatively charged. Therefore, they're attracted towards the positive part of the magnet and repelled by the negative part of the magnet. When we position a magnet close to a copper wire or copper coil, the magnetic force is strong enough to be able to start moving the copper electrons. The electron closest to the positive pole of the magnet wants the edge even closer, and the one next to it wants to fill the void that the first still one have just have left, and the one after that fills the next that. void, and a chain reaction starts in the copper wire. In this simplified example, I'm only showing one end of the copper instead of a loop. There are millions of these electrons in a piece of copper wire. As the electrons move, they generate current. Thicker wire will have more copper, which means it will have more electrons generating current. If the positively charged part of the magnet is directly next to the copper cable, the electrons will be moving towards the magnet at their maximum speed. The alternate part is if the negatively charged part of the magnet is directly next to the copper cable, the electrons will be moving away from the magnet at their maximum speed. Now let's take that magnet and start rotating it clockwise. The magnet is perpendicular to the wire. Note that both the negative and positive poles of the magnet are at equal distance to the copper wire. The attracting power of the positive pole is cancelled out by the repelling power of the negative pole. This means electrons aren't moving so no current is being generated. Current is expressed as amperes or amps so the amps being generated here are zero. If we further rotate the magnet another 90 degrees, we have the south pole of the magnet next to the wire. This negatively charged section of the magnet is now repelling the electrons and they are moving in the opposite direction away from the magnet. The force of the electrons going from one copper atom to another, either towards a positive charge or away from a negative charge is what causes current. Alternating current is the current flowing from one direction, reaching a peak force, decelerating until it stops, and then reversing direction until it reaches another peak force, at which time it slows down and again oh, stops. One complete cycle is from zero to maximum positive, back to zero, to maximum negative, and again back to zero. That's called the Hertz. In North America, we have 60 Hertz per second, and most of the rest of the world uses 50 Hertz per second. A lot of people see the pluses and minuses like plus 2.3 amps and minus 2.3 amps and they get confused and think that one offsets the other. It doesn't. The positive and negative numbers are used to show the movement of the current. Current is caused by the movement of the electrons and it doesn't matter which direction the electrons are moving. Here's a simple analogy. Think about leaving your house, getting in your car and driving down the block. The car starts from zero and accelerates to 30 miles or 30 kilometers per hour. You know there's a stop sign at the end of the block, so you start to slow down and eventually stop. Now let's assume you forgot something at home and decide to back up the same distance you just traveled. You accelerate to 30 again, and then start to slow down as you near your house until you stop. Did you just travel zero distance? Of course not. You traveled double the length of the block you live on even though you're now back at your starting point. You just alternated directions that you traveled. In our car example, you're moving forwards and backwards, but with copper wire, the electrons move to positive and away from negative magnetic forces. By spinning the magnet, we cause the direction of that movement to go backwards and forwards. But calling it backwards and forwards current doesn't sound right, so we just call it alternating current. An ammeter measures the amps or current in a line. Some will show positive and negative values and others won't. Another method of measuring current is to use a digital oscilloscope. Many charts will show positive and negative numbers to reflect the direction of the current. Remember, 
Plus 2.3 amps provides the same current strength as minus 2.3 amps. Let me repeat this critical statement. Current is caused by the movement of the electrons and it doesn't matter which directions the electrons are moving. While the above examples of spinning a magnet are correct and Niagara Falls in the US generates electricity this way, other electrical utilities use the same principle but generate current by spinning a copper coil inside of a magnetic field. There's your generator. As the coil spins, electrons move back and forth. The picture shows a simple hand crank, but utility companies use an outside power source such as steam from coal or gas-fired plants to cause the electrical coil to spin inside of a magnetic field. Or a hamster. Right, hamster on a One wheel. One final note is that since Ben Franklin's experiments with electricity, the commonly used statement about current is that it is said to flow in the opposite direction of the electrons. Okay, so there you have it. So um, I hope you like that historical and then a uh, bit more detailed uh, discussion of alternating current. And um, I'm not going to get into the three-phase power. Okay, hope you enjoy it.